Thank Ferrick and welcome to a special sci-fi spectacular episode of the We Needed Bros podcast as we review season three of The Mandalorian, sift through the major announcements from the recent Star Wars celebration in London, we get assimilated by Picard season three and get emotionally reduced to rubble by a CGI otter in James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy volume three. And we will be delving into spoilers for all the above shows and movies and... Spoilers! Spoilers everywhere! Yes, joining me for his first appearance, because you might recognise that voice, is international tour manager, punk rock guitarist, and the co-curator of the We Needed Roads theme music, Mr. Ben Davis. Ben is the man who can find a thousand brown M&Ms to fill a brandy glass at three in the morning in Sri Lanka. Hey Ben, how's it going? <laughs> I'm very well, man, I'm very well. I love that Wayne's World reference, that's, that's very clever. And you got it right, it was Sri Lanka as well. I mean, it, you, it sounds like you do your homework. That was a deep cut. There was more to it than I thought. <laughs> Yeah, there really was. Thousand brown M&Ms, man. That is a deep cut. I love it. Now, for the uh, listeners, everyone may ask, well, we know David's away because he's on his honeymoon. Congratulations, David. And uh, Jose is currently in a car driving somewhere, also in Florida. And now, I'm not saying that both of them have gone missing since they started doing the podcast, but I'm literally running out of guest co-hosts more than Spinal Tap are running out of drummers at the minute. <laughs> Having said that, Let's um, talk Ben's credentials to be here today. Well, me and Ben went to school together and were even in bands together back in the day when I had hair. Yes, that long ago. And uh, mere minutes after putting out a tweet looking for a guest, Ben answered. And of course, what better person to have on a sci-fi podcast than someone who I remember actually dressed up as Luke Skywalker many, many years ago in a galaxy far, far away when you went to see, uh, I believe it was The Phantom Menace. It and was, that was Phantom Menace, yeah. In a local yeah, newspaper. That was- God, that was yeah, and we were the only people that dressed up as well. We got, we went, uh, we went deep. Uh, me and my buddies, yeah. Uh, and the the newspaper there, there was uh, there was a stormtrooper and Darth Vader, uh, so they clearly hadn't watched the movie. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it was uh, it, that was I'd forgotten all about that man. Well done, <laughs> research, research. Also, uh, yeah. how many times have you now been to Galaxy's Edge, despite living in the UK most of the time? Um, several. Uh, I think. F- five now uh i go and visit my friends out in anaheim quite often and we've got a little gang of us that go uh, and actually on star wars i was out there last week um at which was out there on star wars day should i say and we all got uh, millennium falcon tattoos so we're, we're now officially a flight crew wow i mean come on people know. that's you know you've got a star wars tattoo that's easily enough to talk on our podcast about it <laughs> You're setting that bar really, really low, mate. <laughs> well, mate, I mean, Jose was supposed to be here. Dave was supposed to be here. They're definitely both alive, and I'm sure we'll both see them soon. Oh, is that where I'm supposed to say I have definitely seen them alive, officer? Yes. Right, okay, cool. Well, the, the, the running joke is it's because David's uh, new wife works in forensics, so if she was going to dispose of someone, she would be the person who could do wow. it. I'm sure those pictures David's posting are definitely, definitely real. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely you, you can do a lot with photoshop these days but you know right well first things first if you we're going to start with i think the mandalorian season three and if you didn't watch the book of boba fett then you might be wondering what the hell is going on because in the season two finale of mando luke fucking skywalker turned up to save the day and went off with grogu and r2 to continue his training leaving us with a sad mando now if you were somehow not aware of boba fett then as season three begins with Mando and Grogu, Grogu reunited, you can be forgiven for thinking, what the actual fuck? Um, yes, Boba Fett sucked. That, and it sucked that much that midway through, they just brought Mando back. And he went and found Grogu, who was training with Luke. And Luke let him choose what he wanted to do, despite the same choice being made in the season two finale. And they kind of just pushed Boba Fett to the side because, yeah, that wasn't good. I mean, having said that, do you know what? Season three of Mando, I enjoyed it. I was never bored. The show looked great, as it always does. The action, mostly. But sadly for me, I think this is the overall weakest season of The Mandalorian. Because what was the story? It was just, oh, yeah, we need to retake Mandalore. And that was it. Yeah, I feel like uh, this season, it's suffering from its, its own success. It feels to me like there were a bunch of episodes in there that were setting up the spin-offs. You know, mm. like there was the there was the world's most boring Mandalorian uh, episode ever, which episode started three. out, yeah, which started out with that incredible starship battle where um, uh, Bo Katan's castle gets bombed, where she's just lounging about on that big throne since the last time we saw her in Clone Wars or Rebels, whenever it was. Um, and you know, like it, it, she <laughs> she she gets her castle blown up, and then you're like, whoa, this is going to be awesome. We're going to figure out who's behind this thing, and then all of a sudden it goes into like 
office space. I mean, yeah, who, you know, who didn't want an episode of Doctor Pershing being tortured? You know, it's just like, uh, yeah, I great. didn't want that. No, I don't think any of us did. And talk about copyright infringement. They literally used a torture device on him called a Mind Flayer. Oh, yeah. I didn't pick up on that. That's yeah, really, yeah, come on. Stranger yeah. Things. Yeah. I mean, yeah, oh why, God, why were we suddenly supposed to care about these new characters that we've barely seen before, right? You know, for the whole I mean, episode. There's space for it to, to, to breathe in uh, in other places, I think. And that... that that episode itself, I don't know why I'm picking on that episode because I mean, there's we we just skipped two. It's the worst episodes. episode. <laughs> yeah, so let's start with that one and destroy it. Um, but no, like there was there was elements of it which I thought, oh, cool. If they'd have just cut this together in like a ten minute, you know, cut scene, I'd have been cool. Now get back to the the stuff we want to see, like Mandalorian kicking butt and and making Bo Katan whole. Um, so you know, like that, it it was just drawn out in places it didn't need to be and it was it was difficult for me to sort of get on board with it yeah i mean i think this season it almost became you could have called it the book of bo katan really because there was a running theme in almost <laughs> i think it was pretty much three quarters of the episodes uh someone else online mentioned this she's in the last shot of every episode for about the first four or five episodes yeah yeah she is and it's and it, the sooner she's introduced the show is more excited about her being in it than Mando than the Mandalorian yeah. and I don't know if that's because like she takes her helmet off and you get yeah. to you know you get to see Katie Sackhoff being a badass in sci-fi again which you know ever since Battlestar Galactica that's all I've wanted to have happen right, however yeah. Yeah. you know she got that job I think she got that job because she was the best to do Bo-Katan in um like in Clone Wars and in Rebels and fans were like well she should be the one that gets that job and they've done that a couple of times of like, you know, Ahsoka uh, being cast the way Ahsoka was. Um, and, you know, and that's great. However, you've already paid that lip service to the fans. I don't know that you need to like double down on it and show her so much and so often that you, you start to fatigue the character. Uh, with everyone's, even she has made fun of on TikTok that there's someone's done a TikTok of like, why was she just sitting there on that throne waiting? Yeah, I've seen, I've seen that. That's really good. That was really. I mean, funny. you know, she's clearly got a sense of humour about it. But I mean, yeah, it's just, I don't know, man. I mean, also one of my other issues this season. Well, yeah, sorry, that was the thing. I kept wondering the whole way through the season, are we going to get a betrayal by her on Mando? Purely because Mando's just kind of like basically like it just they take the easy option. Like the whole thing was like. He defeated, he, he got the Darksaber, but she needs the Darksaber to lead the people. And then he literally just like, oh no, there you go, you can have it back. Because she saved yeah. me from a giant mechanical spider underground a few weeks back. So technically we don't have to fight, here you go. There was, there was something I saw online about that as well, which was really interesting to me in that um, Bo-Katan has never actually beaten someone to win the Darksaber. It's the same both times. If like, And I, I haven't actually fact-checked this, so you know it, the internet's probably going to shoot me down here. But um, from what I remember, she gets it second hand the first time she gets it loses it and then there's some sort of washy story how Moff Gideon ends up with it who what was that Darth Maul helmet all about but we'll get back to that in a minute we'll get to that in um, a minute like the like she then she then gets she gets it by accident again like there's no there, there hasn't been a point where bo has gone right fuck this, I'm going in hard and I'm going to win this, that she like beats someone up, gets the Darksaber. It's like, oh, someone dropped it and then she picks it up. And then when she actually finally does like unite the uh, the factions, she's just stood on a hill and just lights up. The, it was like, it was almost exactly the same. It's like they, they almost copied it beat for beat from what I can remember in uh, in Clone Wars. So it was it was very like there had no majesty to it, to her character becoming this like badass like she fights like a demon and those fight scenes, I was so impressed. I was blown away by it. And and then all of a sudden when she gets the Darksaber, she doesn't really it doesn't really lift her up. It's just like, oh, she's got that sword back, has she cool? Yeah, it could just be like a thing that says I'm 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 the boss on it, like a little sign. It doesn't, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think it's I think she uses it once in like a proper way which is a, a mm. bit later on. Now, I was going to say, this time around, the previously great Giancarlo Esposito, who was Moff Gideon, who was scared, who just, he was a bad motherfucker in season one. He was a really cool man. He felt like a Darth Vader cosplayer and slash pantomime <laughs> villain in this. He just came off as so super cheesy in his shiny black suit. And um, he just, he wasn't ominous. He wasn't scary. And that cheesy line he came out with, what was it? It was the time... You know, there's this thing about the suit that makes it good. I'm in it. And you're like, oh, no. Uh, that was almost from Men in Black. 
You know, oh, Will yeah, Smith yeah. puts on those glasses and he's like, yeah. you know, the difference between you and me, I make this look good. And I was like, that's the way to deliver a line like that. Like, I mean, yeah, all right. So Will Smith is Will Smith. But, you know, f- in that moment as well, you've just seen the new Mandalorian-esque star, uh, Stormtroopers, sorry, who, you know, they look cool. Like, you didn't have to, like, you didn't have to, like, double down and go, yeah, like, I'm in this suit, so I'm fucking awesome. It just, <laughs> you're absolutely right in that... It, his his whole character is a badass. He doesn't need to say it. Yeah, exactly. Show, don't tell. And that's what I did a lot of in season one. And in this one, I was just... And all it's, it's really similar. Like, he only rocks up in the last couple of episodes of season one. And it's the same again here. He rocks up in the last two episodes of season three. So all, yeah. the, all the Mandos on different planets and having a Mando having a bath under the Civic Centre storylines from the first couple of episodes... <laughs> I mean, that was the stakes what of the a first bath, couple though. of episodes. What a bath. Yeah, what a dumbass jumping in the water with your suit on and sinking straight to the bottom. Because it wasn't yeah, clear I mean, the first time when I watched that. I was like, did something pull him down? Was it the Mythosaur? And no, he just jumped in and sank to the bottom because he's wearing a heavy fucking suit. Yeah, I think the 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 Mythosaur thing, like they didn't make anywhere near as much of that as I would have hoped as well. Uh, but you know, I think we've I think we've been a little bit harsh on Mando so far. So I'm going to find something positive that I liked in it, and that is. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paz Vega slash Piss Vigler. I can't remember the guy's name. He's the big dude with the machine gun, uh, the chain gun. Yeah. Now, if you had just two or three more of him, they could have easily kicked the shit out of all the super stormtroopers at the end. Like, yeah. he just took them all down. And it was only when they put in the Praetorian guards with their little pointy sticks that he, you know, obviously got beaten. Yeah. I think I feel like there there were a few tropes they were aiming for in that, uh, and you know it's like the, the the old war story, you know the old like um, uh, war movies where you've got like the gunner specialist, and you've got like the explosives expert, and you've got like the the spy guy, which is basically what Bad Batch is. Uh, and I feel like they, I think they maybe they got to the point where they were like, oh, we need a badass gunner guy, and someone went, yeah, cool. Hang on, if we make too many different tropes we'll end up copying Bad Batch with the Mandalorian. So we've got to stop at that guy. But I would have loved to have seen someone with a bit more, like a few more team members around him that had like specialized things or just just someone that was like, yeah, you're right, as well, bad ass as him. And that's the problem is when you've got a whole, when you're trying to introduce a whole bunch of supporting characters who don't take their helmets off, so you can't connect with them <laughs> on that visual level. They're really one note, aren't they? And like, I, yeah. I, you know, I, he was the best one, and I still can tell you can't pronounce his name properly. I know it begins with a P, and his second one begins with a V. That's it. But I mean, the whole point of season three was for them to retake Mandalore, but from what? Like, you don't find out that Gideon and his goons are on Mandalore until the second to last episode. And yes, we saw some local big monsters, but almost every planet they've been on this season has loads of giant monsters trying to eat them or kill them on there. I mean, yeah, there's a few creepy spider droids underground who captured Mando. But this is a whole planet. Are there even enough Mandos to repopulate that planet? Because, again, you didn't get a sense of the scale. You just saw, oh, yeah, there's a bit under the Civic Center. That's where we're going again. And this is one hangar underground base. And, you know, it's a whole planet. And I really thought they should have shown a bit more of it. Yeah, I'd like to have seen a bit more of that myself. Although I do, uh, the way I understood it was, um, you know, Mandal- the, the Mandalorian Din Djarin was... Uh, the guy to prove that it wasn't a poison planet anymore. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what they but were, once he knew, that's what they were taking it back from. But yeah, I mean, like, but it once, but then you know, it, the whole the whole Mandalorian sect are a bunch of people that are that have been like they've been ostracized and they you know they don't trust each other. So they, they don't trust anybody and they don't trust each other. And obviously, him being the one to sort of help reunite them, like I get that. I get that part of the story and how they were driving that part of the story. In that he was they were taking it back from what had happened to it, like reclaiming yeah, yeah. not only the planet physically, but the name of the planet and everything else. So like that part of it, uh, I'm, I, I kind of got, or at least I put that much uh, weight on that part of the story. I'm just saying like at the start of the show, the Mandos, they were living on, and um, I, I can't take it for this, the Empire spoiler special name this. They said, what the hell were they doing living on Monster Island? Like every week there was Monster Island. Episode one, giant crocodiles trying to eat them. <laughs> episode two, giant fucking pterodactyl comes down and like eat choice to eat Paz Vegas kids. You know, they're just innocent creatures going about their business on a planet where suddenly a bunch of jetpack laser shooting dicks start firing at them. <laughs> yeah, it's uh that that is a, do- a documentary I want to see. I want to see the from the David Attenborough narrating it. 
Yeah, um, imagine that. Imagine that. That would be. That would be. I mean, that's a fan video right there. If ever we should make one. And from the uh, vaguely not great to the what the hell were they thinking? We have to talk Pirate King Gorian Shard, or Shard. Yeah. Did they just have a spare Davy Jones knockoff from pirates hanging out in the back somewhere? <laughs> Only he literally doesn't. He say at one point a vast ye Mandalorian or something like that, and you're like, oh. there's a very there's a very piratey thing that he says. There's a piratey that, that thing I, he says. I think I think my uh, my takeaway from that was like, oh, I'm glad there are still people still people on Mandalore. Also, why weren't they poisoned to death like everybody else? They don't really even touch on that, as far as I remember. Why weren't you poisoned yeah. to death? Oh, well, we just really good at holding our breaths. For we live in caves underground with yeah. the spiders. Yeah, monsters. where there's not air that that you know that, that you have to breathe. Uh, all right, look, we're not being very fair to this series. Now we've no. said we were going to spit like put a positive back on it. A couple of things that I that I really enjoyed uh, Grogu's development. Like his his development as a character for me saves that story, saves that arc, yeah. and I and I you know they they really concentrated on that, and I'm really thankful for that because because. They that character is one bad, you know, like moment away from just being awful if they don't handle it right because of how much like fans love that character now. So they've 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 been really careful about they protected Grogu very well, which I really really enjoyed. I mean, yeah, no squeezy bad baby is probably one of the lines of the season. <laughs> uh, bringing back the Antellans, you know, yeah. Oh, and those, uh, yeah, is that is that the little uh, guys that fixed the droid? The little yeah, guys yeah. from uh, the the last sequel movie. Oh god, those are yeah, the, the ones. <laughs> Did you see the internet video where they reckon one of them drops an f bomb? Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, I didn't see the video, but I did notice that you heard in the show. It. Yeah, it's all over the internet with theories that after his second meeting with Groku, one of the Antellans just walks past him when they like got the two puppets like looking really cool on the screen, and he, indeed he does say, "I'm out, motherfuckers," as he runs away from more squeezes. <laughs> good good i'm glad they i mean when you've got a, when you've got a language that you've made up entirely yourself there is quite literally nothing you can't get away with doing so well done them for making that happen yeah someone somewhere's like shit they figured it out or oh, we're gonna get fired <laughs> and they go no it's john favreau oh, okay he's fine oh, yeah, he's fine he's bulletproof right now also uh talking grogu moments we have his first i believe flashback where he is rescued by Jedi Master Kellerin Beck, triumphantly played by our returning Ahmed Best. So justice for Jar Jar, and you know what? <laughs> what a nice moment of redemption for the actor who gets to he gets to dual wield lightsabers as well, man. Yeah, he, but like, and it's not justice for Jar Jar because like he doesn't deserve justice. It's justice <laughs> for Ahmed who yeah. who created that character Fair. online and you know like and built up like a like again. The fans got behind him, and the fans were like, "You deserve a chance at this character." So, you know, he he comes on screen, and I was I was in that moment of like, "I, f- I recognise that guy. Who's that?" And it didn't it didn't take away anything away uh, from me not knowing who it was. But when I found out and then revisited it, I was blown away. I thought it was I thought it was exactly the right thing for that guy to, have, to, to that character and that that actor to be able to do that. I think it's perfect. So one other thing I was going to mention is, like I say, it's um, I, yeah, like you said, I think we've been. It's not a bad series by any stretch of the imagination. Like it's entertaining. The episodes are mostly, I'd say, really decent to good. It's maybe yeah. I think we all said episode three was good, but I think it's in comparison to the previous seasons where the stakes seemed higher, where the, the main story, you know, season one it was finding Grogu, then rescuing Grogu. Season two was taking Grugu back to his own people, and then fucking Luke Skywalker turning up and being amazingly badass. This season was, yeah. we need to take back a planet that's maybe maybe not got some poison on it, and it's there's other stuff, and it's not really as focused on the main characters as the other seasons. True. Did you feel like, because I was talking to a buddy about this earlier today, um, did you feel like it was a soft reset so that they can get Mandalorian and Grogu back to a place where they can just go and be bounty hunters? Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's where we end up, isn't it? At the end of the season. That, yeah, and I feel like, I feel like you know he, in Mandalorian especially, he pledges his like fealty to Bo-Katan in that battle. He, you know, just before they they have that battle, and he's like, you know, that's why I'll fight for you. And then they they get the planet back, and he's like, right, I'm out. See you later. So like he's he's not even like really sticking to his own creed. I guess he's sticking to his own creed, but not the creed that he kind of believes in. So. That I think I feel like there's 
the series was really jagged for me and I did enjoy it. I really loved it. I yeah. will watch it again. Uh, I love the show. I, you know, the, the, the actors they've got in it are just phenomenal. You know, the talent in there is incredible, but having like having a series that is now the linchpin of the entire um, Star Wars connected universe. Mm. I think, like I said at the start, that's, that's where it's, a victim of its own success. They're going to have that now MCU it, problem, aren't they? Where they're going to everything yeah. is going to have to tie into the upcoming stuff. Yes, or they'll have that um, MCU thing where they start to lose track of it, and all <laughs> of a sudden, it, it there's a plot hole there, and there's a big plot hole here. And we all know what Star Wars fans are like. We're all you know, massive nerds who don't want to grow up, and we'll find those things, and it will be difficult to swallow. Well, I think that's why you've got Dave Filoni doing the Mando Universe film when it all comes to an end, isn't it? Because he's kind of like yeah. the Bible on it um, from all the things. Did you think the armor was going to betray them in this in the second to last episode? Because that episode is called The Spies. Two spies. Yeah. And we only see the one at the start before we get the really bad Shadow Council bit. I mean, it was cool, but it was also bad because I was like, who are you people? Like, you know, we've not seen yeah, any yeah. of you before. And then you're hinting uh, at Grand Admiral Thrawn, who I get is a big deal from the uh, animated the show, but if you haven't seen it, you don't know about him. No, so they're like they're trying to build him up, aren't they? They're trying yeah, to build yeah. this this myth, like this like it's this scary guy that you don't see. It's the guy, the boogeyman in the shadows, and they're doing that thing where if they talk him up enough, when he finally comes on screen, you'd be like, oh yeah, he is scary. But it's not working, I don't think, for people that haven't seen the animated shows. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, I thought the armorer, yeah, I thought the armorer was a betrayer, but I thought that the armorer was going to be the one that had betrayed the Mandalorians to yeah, to, to Moff Gideon. So yeah. Because who builds all their suits? Yeah, right. Like that it, I mean that makes sense. It's yeah. been very busy. They never seem to run out of money and places to stay, so you know. <laughs> I've just kind of, uh, I've just boxed myself into a corner there because obviously the Mandalorians give their money because it's like a religion. They give all their money to um, essentially the, the the armorer, king of the church, right? Yeah, the armorer. Yeah. So yeah, that's why she's the always got money. I guess that could be explained away. The, the Pope, the Mandalorian the Pope, Pope. That is a horrible concept. This is the way. Um, now, my <laughs> final question on Mando is because we've had Andor as well, which slides slowly, but then turned into probably one of the best Star Wars things ever, in my opinion, that has been made. And it proved to people that Star Wars isn't just like CGI stuff for kids. It can be proper adult serious drama done really fucking well as well. And now, does Andor just existing in that same thing, maybe people who watched it and really enjoyed it, a lot of the hardcore Star Wars fans, now you look at Mando and you're like, oh, it's just a bit, bit for kids now. It's a bit... It's not... It's it can't compete because it can't be the same type of show. You've, you're going from, you know, give us, give me as much as Grogu, Grogu pissing around with the Anzellans as I want. I love all that stuff. But the actual main thrust of the storyline is nowhere as interesting and as well acted. And again, you know, you look at um, Andor, you have got Stellan Skelsgard delivering Shakespearean style monologues. You've got Andy Serkis turning up and just stealing the whole show for a couple of episodes. Like every actor in it, Fiona Shaw just being absolutely amazing in it and then you've got a bunch of people with helmets you can't really connect with in the show you know so it's yeah i don't know that i agree with that i think that um i think mandalorian is the same show that it started out to be i just think that the andor has has taken the tv aspect of it and like you say made it a little bit more adult made it a little bit more uh relatable in in ways that 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 matter to me personally, for instance, you know, mm. like, uh, you know, like the governments and, the, you know, the corruption that happens even from the good guys as well as the bad guys. Whereas Mandalorian was always just about some guy, you know, turning up and kicking ass. So I don't yeah. I don't feel like they've I don't feel like the, the show has changed fundamentally on that on that base level. I just think that uh, they've shot themselves in the foot by making Andor as good as it was. <laughs> uh and also, how many characters is Andy Serkis allowed to play in the Star Wars universe? All of them. Because he's already been Snoke, and now he was that guy where he didn't have to do any CGI or wear any stuff. So but he I couldn't mean, swim. He's, he's, he couldn't swim then. But like, okay, so if we're going to go into Andor, if if you were that, if you were and Cassian Andor, you'd have been like, you'd have dragged him off the edge with you, and then like Baywatched swam him somewhere. Like there's, that is, that is the stupidest reason to not get off and explode. I can't swim and I'd have fucking jumped. Yeah. Cause you know, you would explode otherwise. Although I'm scared of heights. So I might not have, I might, might have a, a 
close my eyes. Risk the explosion. And yeah. And, and screen. Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> All right. So uh, that, I think that about rounds us off on Mando season three. If you had to give it a rating out of 10, what would your rating be? Uh, I would go for like a solid seven. Um, cause I, the bits that I enjoyed, I really, really, really enjoyed like some of the most beautiful scenes, like when, uh, like bo ship is breaking out of atmosphere and it's raining and like, it's just, it's just stunning visually, absolutely incredible. Uh, and you know, the, the fight scenes were amazing. You know, the, I, I loved, um, uh, grief, Kaliga. Karga. Grief K- Karga, thank you. Uh, like, you know, him running his planet and doing a really good job on that. So those bits were phenomenal. However. As uh, a person that watches a lot of TV and movies and, you know, uh, I I tend to get stuck on the little things. And it was the little things in this that really that dropped a couple of what I would have called points, mm. you know, off the top of that score. What about you? What did you give it? I'd go for a solid six. Ooh. One down. Yeah. I mean, I enjoyed Tough it. Audience. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. But, you know, I'd, I'd probably give someone like Andor an eight or a nine. It's very, it's, you know, you have to be really almost a perfect run of a season to be a 10 out of 10 for me. So, uh, uh, but so six like, is good. Did, it's, six is a recommendation, you know. Yeah, I mean, like, in if you do, if you are comparing Star Wars series, like, I de- I, Andor would get, like, from me, probably seven, eight. Obi-Wan would get eight, verging on a nine, because it was, really you know, for me, it was, yeah, I loved it. I thought it was, I d- I thought I it was gone phenomenal. I yeah, no, I know. I've, I listened to the. Um, I listened to you be wrong about that on one of your podcasts <laughs> earlier. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, but no, I see. I really love that series. Uh, uh, probably from a, a nostalgia point of view, as much as anything else. Ha- and and it just it wrapped it wrapped a story up. I loved the like the layer thing and like you know which a lot of people didn't like. Yeah, so, no, I yeah, thought she know, was good. Like, she was one of the highlights. Young Leia, she was really good. I quite yeah, happily have watched um, the whole show with her just getting into trouble. <laughs> yeah like but that's that's definitely a kid show uh you know that's like a like yeah. a, a mischievous like star wars kids but like but if in, in the world of comparisons that's sort of where i would sit so just okay. to give you an idea of you know so uh yeah as we mentioned we had star wars celebration in the uk a few weeks maybe a month or so back now it depends when this podcast comes out really but um the big news was <laughs> last year yeah last year they announced three new star wars films but like properly announced them as opposed to saying, oh yeah, Taka Waititi's doing one. Oh yeah, um, the guys from Game of Thrones might be doing one. Rian Johnson might be getting his own. You know, that was all kind of never confirmed as strongly mm. as they've done with these three new announcements. And what I like about it is they haven't announced new trilogies. They've just announced three films, but set in a completely different time period. And that means the simple idea is if which one, if if they're all big successes, great. You can keep doing sequels. If they're not, mm. oh well, one and done. So I like that. It's clever from a corporate over empire kind Lord. of way of looking at <laughs> overlords. Yeah. So first up, we're gonna have well, not first up, but first set, first set on the new Star Wars timeline, which was quite nice. They like showed it all, didn't they? From where all mm. the shows and movies are going to take place over. It was kind of like the Marvel faces, wasn't it? But for Star Wars, yeah. so that's pretty cool. And yeah, the first one in times of in terms of timeline is, and this is not the official title, but this is what people are calling it, is going to be The Dawn of the Jedi, directed by James Mangold. Now, Mangold made one of the best comic book films of all time with Logan. He did the better than expected Ford versus Ferrari, and I'm really excited by the trailers he's done for the new Indiana Jones film that's coming out in a couple of weeks' time here. Mm, the fourth yeah. Indiana Jones film, because there was, definitely wasn't another Indiana Jones film that was so bad, the government had to use the Men in Black Zapper on the whole world. But the trailer looks great, and obviously... I was at the I was at the uh, the press premiere for that uh, Crystal Skull, and... Uh, yeah, not heard I, of that one. I, but... uh, okay, there was... So, <laughs> in an alternate timeline, there was a, there was a uh, uh, an Indiana Jones movie after... Um, uh, Last, Last Crusade. Crusade, which which is the best Indiana Jones movie. There was another one where um, George Lucas jizzed all over the film, and <laughs> ET was in it. It was uh, it was weird, but there is there's legitimate <laughs> bit in there that, that worked for me. Uh, but anyway, you were doing something else about Star Wars. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow walking back from ET and George Lucas's jizz. Yes, basically, <laughs> Disney are that impressed, and that's a great segue into talking about Disney from Lucas and jizz. That they are that <laughs> impressed by the work Mangold's obviously done on the new Indiana Jones film, the fourth, that they've given him a Star Wars. 
and he has pitched it to them as a biblical epic set 25,000 years before the earliest point of the existing Star Wars timeline, and it will be a almost religious Ten Commandments-style epic about the beginnings of the Force. Well, this is obviously going to be awesome, right? I mean, yeah, apart from all the religious nonsense they keep throwing in there, but I do forget that the Jedi Order is kind of a religion. Um, yeah, how? Yeah, it, it, James Mangold, uh, didn't he do uh, one of the really good X-Men uh, movies? Yeah, Logan. Well, am I getting confused? No, was there another one? Was it an actual X-Men movie that he did? Or was I, I, I know. I think he just did Logan. Okay, so Logan, obviously, truly outstanding. Uh, and then they released the black and white version of it, which was, was mind-blowing. Uh, but <laughs> the, yeah, the... If if he brings that gravitas, if he can if he can stay away from from studio interference, I think this is going to be this will be the next trilogy. I I think they, all three of them have got a good chance to be a, a trilogy. To be fair, well, actually, no, no, I yeah, don't know, no, I don't actually. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We're probably thinking of the same one. Same one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, and I, and let's just get onto that one then, because the second one they announced is a Mandoverse film directed by Dave Filoni that's going to wrap up all the Mandoverse TV shows which must be some way off because we haven't even had the first series of Ahsoka yet. And I'd imagine there'd be at least one more season out of that show, uh, unless it suffers from Boba Fett syndrome. And also we haven't... Yet no way. Seen... Well, no. Nothing Not going to be... happen. Not going to happen. No. <laughs> no, no. I'm a bit more hopeful from that trailer. Also, we are yet to see Skeleton Crew. Is that going to be part of the Mandoverse? Interesting thought. That does look really good. That, that like, I mean, just on the that was screenshots and stuff that we've seen. Yeah, I mean, you can put Jude Law in most things, and he's fantastic. But mm. you know, give, given given that vehicle, uh, I'm yeah, I'm I'm excited for that actually quite heavily. Well, someone said that um, for Skeleton Crew, the idea was they're going to take kind of Stand by Me and the Goonies and mix it with Star Wars. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you have to keep taking other things and putting them in other things, then sure. That if why not? Why not do stand by? I, I suppose when it's been over, I suppose when it's been almost forty years since those other things, though, people have forgotten. That's true. The kids are today, eh? Millennials. Oh, sure. uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I, I don't think any of them listen to us, man. I saw the stats of our downloads, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm more mixed on this because. Um, Filoni, despite being the godfather of Star Wars knowledge because of his work on the animated shows, I don't think he's got as much freedom here as Mangold will have because he has to tie in all the plot threads from multiple TV shows that him and Favreau are working on at the same mm. time as getting developing the film. And uh, Mando's biggest issue usually is that the stakes aren't really that high in it. Usually it's just, all the stakes are just, you know, it's, oh, we're going to go here and do this this week. And I, like we were talking about earlier, like we the earlier seasons when it's just them kind of going on missions each week and side quests, that's what we really enjoy about it, more than the overarching net arc that they try and do in each season. So tying everything together into a super arc for a film, ah, I'm, I, yeah, I'm a bit more kind of, I'm not too sure on this one. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think this has got the, I don't think this has got the legs. I mean, well, I, I want it to be amazing. I want it to be something, something special. Like it, the Ahsoka series is going to be the, the linchpin of it for me, because if like, Mandalorian is now like the umbrella under which a lot of these things stand and you can put you could do a Mandalorian movie today yeah. and just have Mando and Grogu kicking ass taking names throw in a cameo and you're you know you're stoked um yeah. when it's got a like when it's got to pull in all the threads from all these other little these places that's that's what I think that Mandalorian season three like why it fell behind because it had to start laying out set pieces for all these spin-offs I 100% agree with you on that so yeah, I think this is going to be a one and done. It's gonna it's gonna be a wrap up, wrap it all up, and then Filoni can just take a rest and go. <sighs> yeah, just count all, all of his money, all of and his, count all his, all of his money. money. Yeah, and then the third film that's been announced is seeing Daisy Ridley come back to the uh, Star Wars universe for a film set 15 years after the rise of Skywalker, which the internet has decided to call Dawn of the Jedi, uh, directed by <laughs> Charmin. Really... Uh, yeah, well, you know why not? Uh, and it's going to be directed by Charmin Obeid Chinoy. Now, this is massively interesting as a directorial choice because I'll freely admit I'd not heard of her before. And a quick Google reveals she is a Pakistani-Canadian journalist, activist, and filmmaker with a lot of her work highlighting gender inequality against women. Man, you can already hear all the incels who hated like Daisy Ridley's character in their basements crying, can't you? Yeah. Poor and, them, um, though, because they might miss out on a banger of a movie if this is oh, if this the direction it's going to take. I'm, well, I'm more into it now than I was... Yeah, before I heard about it. Looking at her CV, she won the Best Short Film Oscar for a film called Saving Face in 2012. But her first real step outside of her activism and issues filmmaking, she directed two episodes of Miss Marvel last year, which is obviously what's put her on Disney's radar 
and I'm guessing for a, a new Star Wars film. Interesting. And yet, like I say, I'm more interested in this than the Mando film because this takes us to the furthest point in the future of the Star Wars timeline. And I'm just intrigued whether this is going to be a bit more of an adult take on Star Wars, which we know can be done. And again, why have such a strong female-focused voice as this director on it if you're not going to do that? I mean, Daisy really must be thinking, fuck yes. I, you know, I've got a really strong female director behind us who's actually going to give me shit to do. It's, you know, I, I, I can't wait to see... Well, they're not, because all the people who hate, hated it in the first place, they're not going to watch this. They're going to bitch about it and not see it. But getting a really strong, f- powerful female filmmaker behind this, I bet, you know, how many Star Wars actors are watching something like Andor and going, that's how you fucking do it. That's Give us stuff like that to do. And it's just going to be great, man. I can't wait for it. So I think I'm I'm tied between this and Mangold's film from what I want to see most. I mean, they're all going to be good, right? They're all going to be excellent. But the potential mm. from the, the, those two is excellent. I'm going to say, actually, I'm still on the fence on the Ray one, and I, and I, it's the it's the Mangold and the Mando films I'm most excited about to see. Okay, but before we move on to the next part of the podcast, we always ask for your listener comments and questions and death threats. No, not death threats. We're joking. Uh, on on uh, Twitter, and uh, we got uh, our friends over at Pedestrian at Best sent us this comment on Mando. I've only seen Mando. Well, that's good, because they're only talking about Mando. I liked a lot more about Season 3 than Season 2. Even a ridiculous guest star episode, which we didn't talk about. Uh, This is the way drinking game could get really crazy. So someone likes Season (laughs) 3 more than Season (laughs) 2. Yeah, that's great. I think that's, you know what? And I I think that's really important that 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 comment happened right now, actually, because it's not not our Star Wars anymore. It's not just our Star Wars anymore. You know, like the the prequel movies weren't our kind of Star Wars, but there were kids that grew up loving it, and and they understand they understand something different about it than we do. So that people that are coming to this series series and only watching this series, that's a really good point because they don't get the gravity of maybe of Luke Skywalker being there and stuff. Yeah, they're like, who's this guy who just turned up and took Grogu away? We hate him, probably not. not. Yeah, <laughs> I'm actually, I bet some people did. But anyway, that rounds us off for the Mandalorian and Star Wars in general for now. And now it's time to set faces to fun. Because it's Star Trek time. <laughs> yes, that was a terrible, terrible segue. And But the reason for it is because season three of Picard is the most fun I've had with a Star Trek show in absolute ages. Most Friday mm-hmm. nights when it was on in the UK, I'd get in from the cinema around 11 o'clock midnight. And then the first thing I'd do instead of going to sleep at the end of a long week, I'd watch the latest episode of Picard before I went to sleep. Because mm-hmm. it was yeah. just that good. It was that good. So season three of Picard was phenomenal um, and you can uh, like and it was easily the best thing in the star trek universe um since uh lower decks i think lower decks has been incredible and we're, we're you know, gonna agree like, on that as well <laughs> damn it uh and yeah so lower decks has been has, has been phenomenal in a very very different way uh but picard yeah oh, i mean come on man like who who thought that was gonna be as good as it is no, I mean, if we go back to it, season one, you know, season one was pretty good. You know, it was obviously taking Picard, uh, John Luke Picard and Patrick Stewart coming back to the role after however many years, a lot of years, mm. and doing something interesting and clever with it. And I enjoyed it enough, and I, it kind of lost its way a little bit towards the end, I thought. I was like, you know, I enjoyed it from the start. I thought visually it looked amazing, like all the money was there yeah. on the screen with it. Oh, and I was yeah. like, okay. Even though it didn't live up to the how great it started, I was I was I was I was there for every episode. And then season two, I stopped watching yeah. about three or four episodes in with all the ice stuff and the immigration storyline. And I think at this point, and I, I we mentioned this offline before we started, sci-fi has always been used as a metaphor for current world events. That's how filmmakers used to address issues in, against mainstream Hollywood and the world that weren't when they weren't dealing with them. I mean, the next generation. Uh, Star Trek The Next Generation was doing stories about trans issues back in the early 90s. Great sci-fi who has always reflected the issues of today. And yet, in season two of Picard, they went back in time to the modern day. And uh, Captain Spanish-sounding guy's name, who I can't remember, he was in Lost. He gets arrested by ICE agents, and it's a whole deportation storyline. And I'm sorry, no, you've lost me. The whole point of good sci-fi is for, for allegory, for using this to reflect what's going on in the real world. If you just go straight to that time and address it straight on, you're kind of missing the point. And look, I agree, it's an issue that needs raising, especially. But you need to be clever about it in if you're doing Star Trek. You just need to be yeah. clever about it. I think uh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, sci-fi, 
it's it, it's also an escape you know like it, it, it's escapism and you find parallels like you're you're given a, a scenario that might reflect what you're going through in life that is that you don't want it you might not be able to deal with head on or you you can't you you can't deal with head on and you get these characters who are extraordinary dealing with something that feels the same that you're dealing with and they're succeeding so it gives you the hope and maybe that you can succeed in your life and I feel like they definitely took that power away um especially where like you know with the, with the ice agents and the and the, and the um the uh, you know illegal uh well, illegal immigrants or however you want to you know, name that storyline but yeah I again I completely agree that that was a mistake did in, you finish just in season two yeah I didn't. I didn't go back to it. Mm. And then I and I it's, just it's really it's really important that you did because season three doesn't make much sense. If well, you no, didn't. but I I thought it, I picked up season three quite easily. I didn't okay. think there was so there's, anything. There's a couple of things when I say doesn't make sense. There's a couple of things that happen at the end of season two where because you know it feels like season three just it completely ignores season two. Yeah, it's yeah. Just like there was no there was nothing. So. Season two, um, what's her name? Science Chops, uh, drummer yeah. from the band in Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Alison Pill. Um, that's what I said. She um, she becomes Borg, right? Yeah. So she she becomes Borg Queen. Well, season three of Picard, they've got a pretty big fucking Borg problem. So you'd have thought that Picard would have picked up his communicator and gone, ah, oh, here, Alison, got some trouble with some Borg, got some rogue Borg on the on the way. Can you just hook up to the uh to the you know the mainframe and just tell him to fuck off because <laughs> it's quite it's quite literally like a borg ally that he's got sat there doing nothing they talk about this borg threat the very end of season two of picard they make friends with the borg right, right. pretty much what happens i mean i'm paraphrasing it's more complicated yeah, yeah. Than that. <laughs> however however you know, so you feel like you feel like Picard's like dealt with that demon a little bit, and then they, you know, they jump straight back into season three, and it's like, and I got excited because the, you know, the um, uh, the Shakespeare's were there, and I was like, yeah, the, the Dominion. Well, well, the Dominion were the um, uh, the Jem'Hadar and the Shapeshifters, right? I thought that was the the, the collective type term from. Okay, Pokemon. yeah, yeah. No, however, good. however, at the very end of season two, Q turns up to actually, to send them back in time. So my thought there, yeah, right. So Q, Q is the problem in in season two, right? Like he's right. yeah, he's yeah. the one that sent them back. So he turns up and he says at the end, there's this really like teary ending where Q basically dies, and which which is, I can see the expression on your face right now because of what <laughs> happens in season three, which is where there's a few more fucking problems. So um, so Q turns up at the end and he's like. Uh, oh, you know, he's basically been teaching Picard a lesson about humanity all the way through his entire fucking journey, you know, from um, uh, the Farpoint uh, um, pilot. pilot. Yeah, like, yeah. All, all the way, you know, all the way through to this one. And they have like, and, you know, Q says, basically, I, you've been a friend. Like, you've been, a, you've been my best mate for fucking years. And I just wanted you to realise your potential and blah, blah, blah. And so for me, it's like he... The the he, he make Picard makes friends with the Borg, so that's that that's that one done. Done scratched off the list. Q has said, "Well done, Picard. You win." Like you know, we're mates. I've just been trying to. I've been testing you. Scratch that off the board. So then he clicks his fingers and he sends them all back home. Uh, and for me, I guess the only thing I can take away from that is like in in my infinite um, uh, leeway that I give all sci fi because it is. You know, it is you suspend your imag- you know, suspend your disbelief. Otherwise, you don't get anything from it. Um, you know, Q maybe has done a bit of a reset, and you know, like he's he for me, he clicks his fingers and he goes right. None of season two happened. This is a hard reset now, so we can jump straight back into season three. It would have been great if they had the balls to do that at the start of the season. It's just like John Delancey on screen. By the way, season two, yeah, <laughs> break the fourth wall. <laughs> Didn't yeah. happen. But yeah, but that was. That was that to me was yeah I was like oh, so right. well that's good there because you filled in all the listeners and me who hadn't seen the rest of season two because it just got god awful and all <laughs> I honestly thought I'd missed when season three started was oh we got together with his uh, Romulan housekeeper oh good for Picard yep that happened and then he just absolutely fucks off and leaves her for this whole series for but his anyway, ex girlfriend for his, his on off ex girlfriend 
Yeah. Like, I mean, if they wanted to do, I mean, I, I applaud, I, yeah, again, I applaud um, them for still making Star Trek. Like, I absolutely like applaud them because I uh, have enjoyed that, you know, I'm a Deep Space Nine guy. Like, I love that, like, all of Star Trek when I was a kid. Um, and, you know, I do now. And, like, they have, they have, like you say, touched on some really, really important things that, you know, throughout my life, you know, given, given you check and balance in in some of life's you know harder decisions i like that every um species of alien represents a different uh facet of human life like the klingons are your anger and like you know the um the romulans are like maybe your like your less honest side and the vulcans are logic so they nice, all they, when you when you put all of those species together you get this you get this really rich tapestry, which, you know, we call humanity. And then, you know, the humans, uh, we're the ones making mistakes because we're the youngest ones in the Federation, even though we made the Federation, which is a weird thing. You wouldn't go and join a kid's club as an adult. So, that, you know, but again, suspending disbelief. So, yeah, uh, like when when season three came out of the gate, like season two hadn't really happened. I was both confused and simultaneously like all right with it because yeah, of yeah. how hard it came out of the gate and I, so yeah like it, well, and confusing I th- and i think that's the thing isn't it um those of us who are trek fans like myself but we're just like oh no season two it's gone off the boil i'm not bothering uh, well, not you know just end the show now and then there was all the things oh no but but for season three they're bringing back all the next generation cast i was like okay but and what, then they said, including Data, who's died seven fucking times now or something. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. Bring them all back. Okay, great. And then I saw, though, oh, but wait a minute. It's the exact same team, production team and writers and creators who did season two, which was so bad. So this is one of the biggest examples of like, holy shit, they absolutely nailed it on this one. I mean, I haven't got on my list of notes for this show. I've pre- I was going to go pros and cons, but it's pretty much all pros. First up, most important thing for me that just I think for most fans, the amount sheer amount of ship porn in this show. <laughs> like the shipyard museum was superb, man. And I, I love how they passed all the classic ships and you had all the different theme musics kind of wove in and out as they did it. That was so good. Yeah. I mean I should I should probably actually mention what season three is nominally about. So mm-hmm. there's a, a medical transport ship with Dr. Crusher on it that's getting attacked. She's here with a young bloke who's English for some reason, and they're mm-hmm. getting attacked by people and people. Picard's down chilling out with his housekeeper, and then he gets a message come through to, oh, on a private channel. So, of course, he goes and calls up his best mate, Riker. They go, yeah, we better go and steal a ship. They steal the ship. No, they don't steal the ship. They go and get on the ship when they, like, try and use all their, like, we're admirals, we're captains, we can kind of, we want to go here, take us there. And then they bump into Captain Liam Shaw, who is fucking awesome. Yeah, who's he's like, great. <clears throat> he's just like, no, no, I'm not taking you there. I'm, 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 by, the, I'm by the book guy, so uh, no. And then, of course, they just happen to have Seven of Nine as first officer on that ship as well. So you can kind of see how it's just an amalgamation of all the best bits. And what I think this show has done really well, because it's fan service uh, at its best, and, but... What makes fan service good in this case is you get to spend time with all these actors and characters that you loved from the original Next Generation series. And it's just, it's just I think you look back at some of the earlier Next Generation stuff and it's quite basic in a way. It's written in the, the performances. So seeing these actors with the weight of probably the biggest roles of most of their careers and they're getting to act it one more time in the modern day and it's just you're watching it going... The rain, the acting is so much better in this show from those same actors yeah. than it was back in the day. Yeah, I mean, is that because they've got, uh, a, got like better, a, a, a better scripts? Yeah, they, I think yeah, they got money. better scripts. They got a, maybe a, a, like a, a better canvas on which to paint these characters on as well. I mean, it's not only the nice. next generation; it's the it's the movies as well. Mm. You know, they've got the, the, the movies to 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 you know to to sort of rely on if you like. Um, like I say, Data. I think Data died three times before. Yeah, I, I, I lost track of how many series. times. So, um, you know, so like, there's, there's definitely, you can definitely feel that in this for sure. And it, you know what? It, I think the supporting cast, like all the bridge crew of, is it the Titan they're on? Yep, the Titan. I think it is. So they're on the Titan, and so the supporting cast, the bridge crew of the Titan, you really get the feeling that they are, that are there 
almost not inexperienced, but they are newer to the job. And I think that comes across a because of the script and B because of the weight of the characters that have played these people for so, so long. Like when you're acting in a room with those people, even if you are the best, you know, the best new actor out there um, and you come up to someone who has played, you know, a character for more than 20 years, you're going to feel a little bit intimidated by that. And the way that 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 comes across and the way that they captured that, I think was absolutely beautiful. I really, really dug it. Well, you've got the scene later on, haven't you, when Geordie turns up and it turns out uh, Captain Shaw was like an engineer when he started out and he just completely geeks out over Geordie, which was superb. We should really mention the the um, the interplay between uh, the Captain of the Titan uh, and Seven of Nine. How, like, he, she thinks that he hates her. He refuses to call her Seven of Nine. He, he wants her to have a human name. Like, and that is one of those... Like what we you find out towards the end, it's like a tough love thing. Um, but that that relationship like drove so much of the early plot points of this series that, and I was all in. I was I was I was like, you know what? If he's an arsehole, brilliant. He's playing the arsehole great. And like when he dies, everyone's going to be happy about it. But like, it, and then I was and then thinking like, oh, you know, spoiler. What, you know, what if he's not? What if? Well, I mean, I I don't know. I've been thinking about spoilers. Where he kind of. And where he ends up in that show, like I was happy with that as well. There was, yeah, yeah. there was no, there was no way, and there was no way that he was going to lose as a character for me. And I, and yeah, more power to him. They're absolutely fantastic work. And that's what this show does brilliantly. Like you like said, you get your time, you get great stuff with all the next generation crew. As there's, it's almost like they bring them back one by one each episode, didn't they? Until you kind of got yeah. almost everyone back. But like you just said. What the show does so well is the introduction of the new crew, the new supporting mm. characters in it, and they're so well written. Sure, obvious one is the obvious is the obvious one. Uh, let's talk villains. You've got Amanda Plummer's Vadic, who is just superb. Oh God, she is. Uh, she's the one in the ship that's chasing them, trying to yeah, trying to get in Picard. The Shrike. The Shrike. She, that's the name she of is ship. also the any of you motherfuckers move from yes. fiction lady. She is. Yeah, she is. That was, I recognise her straight away from that. And she's been in a few things recently, and I, I couldn't name them if, if my life depended on it, but I've noticed her do more and more stuff recently. And it's it's been with that same energy and same passion from that Pulp Fiction, uh, that, those Pulp Fiction scenes where, you know, she plays she plays a gun-toting, you know, like, like robber with against Tim Roth, who, you know, who is an incredible like presence on, sta- on screen. And... It, it, she brings, uh, but she's also really vulnerable in those scenes as well because she's scared. She's like, there's, there's, you know, Samuel L. Jackson's character pulls a gun on her, but you get that same range in this Star Trek like series, which is incredible because she's a badass villain that wants to take down uh, Picard and do do the things that she's got to do. But she's also answerable to someone, and you get that same, which is absolutely brilliant, brilliant casting. And that's what exactly you nailed it on the head there, man. You, she, when she's when we before we learn about her, she's just out and out villain. But it's that episode where you find out a bit that she's been manipulated herself and that she's going to be just snuffed out if she doesn't do what she wants to do. And it was just, yeah, like she was so well done in that show, man. She was such a good character. Yeah. And that, of course, it brings on to who her character is. And she is a changeling. And this show crosses the streams of Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. So we have the changings coming back as a villain. Which for me was enough. Like, I yeah. would have loved because there's because there's. Well, another you can agree this... on the same point of where this show ends as well. We are, yeah, we are <laughs> probably. Um, the that was enough for me. Like the, the extra element that I'm guessing you're going to talk about, like you know, later on. In fact, I've already I've already spoiled it by talking about well, the Borg. This is earlier spoiler on. podcast, mate. Like, it, what it is, but I didn't know if there was an order to it that you wanted no, to reveal no, no. stuff in. Just jump in. Uh, however, so like so for me, like you don't need to bring back the Borg. Like yes. if you've got the changelings, you've got the changelings in there, and I was like. Fuck! This is brilliant. A rogue faction of changelings that have like that have that have mutated into something more, so that you, so you they can, can't they be can spotted. Bleed. Yeah. Oh my god! I was like, you've never seen Picard come up against the changelings. That was you know it was purely a DS9 thing. Worf's had his experiences, yeah, and his trauma from that. Like, and, and may I just tap into how amazing Worf's character was in this oh. series? Pacifist so, we'll Worf. Come back to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't even, don't even. Like he's, he, he was so good. Um, but you get the changelings, and I was like, oh my god! Like all you need is, is that for Picard to go up against a, a DS9 villain who you know nearly wiped out the entire Alpha Quadrant, like with almost ease. 
So then you get like one of the most um, like fearsome, you know, clever and devious bad guys up against the, one of the, you know, the purest heroes of Star Trek. And I was like, that is perfect. And then all of a sudden you find out that they've like teamed up with the Borg and I was a bit, it cheapened it for me a little. Yeah. Because you, like you said, the Borg were the baddies in the last series. We've had Borg. We've had. It's because they're Star Trek's one of their greatest villains. Yeah, and and you know what that happens with Batman. It's like you know, if if a Batman movie does badly, oh, next time we'll do the Joker. And it's like, all right, man, you can. Why don't you just do other bad guys well? And they stood. They like Star Trek should have. They should have been brave. Like series one for me of Picard should have been the big bad at the end. Should have been the Borg. It should have, in in my opinion. It would have landed harder if, for some reason, humans had inadvertently created the Borg, sent them through that wormhole, and then, fuck. Oh, no, the Borg are our fault. That's bad, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> right, okay, that gives us a bit of an existential crisis there. So season two could have dealt with that, leave the Borg behind, and then come in hot with the Dominion threat. Oh, dude, I was so excited about that. Yes, the Dominion, DS9, was. DS9 was Star Trek when it started doing serialized storytelling. You know, mm. it went from episode of the week anomaly, let's investigate that gaseous cloud over there. It went from that because even Next Generation, it, it had it had very few multiple part storylines. There'd always be like a mid season mm. two parter, like most famously, Best of Both Worlds was in the middle of the season. I think. Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah. it could have been the end. But yeah, it, it, you, it, there was never, like, in a 22-episode run season, there would never be, like, an ongoing storyline that no. arced out of thing. And it was only when... And even the start of DS9 wasn't like that. It was when Ronald D. Moore really kind of took control of the show. In, I, I'm not sure mm-hmm. what season it was, but when, once the whole Dominion and Federation war storyline kicks off, and then yeah. you get the religious stuff. And it's, it's, it's such a weird thing. Like you say, Ron D. Moore, who then went on to do Battlestar Galactica... And of course, what's the big thing with Battlestar Galactica? And again, I hated this when I first. I not. I didn't hate the show, so I loved it. But when they announced it, and they said, "Oh yeah, the idea now is that Cylons can look like humans," I was like, "You cheap bastards!" It's just because you don't want yeah. a bunch of CGI shiny Cylons. And then I remember you saying that when that came out, and you were like, "Oh, I can't believe they're gonna. They're, what they're doing? Just trying to save money because they haven't got enough budget to make Cylons." And I was like, "Give me a chance, man!" And you were like, "Fuck that!" And then we're like, about four weeks later, you were just like, "Yeah, it's pretty yeah, good." It's, isn't it? Yeah, the first de- <laughs> first episode, I was hooked. Thirty three, I was like. And yet, oh, and that what, episode. Oh. Yeah. So the point being, Ron D. Moore, who started on DS9, then goes and creates Battlestar, where anyone can appear as anyone. And what's the plot line in this? The Dominion can now look like anyone. Ties it all together. So they've literally gone back to the. But the great thing is, going forward in an episodic show where it's not story of the week, it's an ongoing arc which develops over the course of the season. And doing that with the next generation characters, which we never had, is just just what makes the show. So now. Uh, we're going to get into... Let's have a look. Look at my notes. Let's talk Worf. Worf as pacifist with perhaps one of the greatest intro scenes <laughs> of Star Trek time. I am, I can't remember it all. I, I recited it on a previous episode and I do not have that in front of me now. But it was I am Worf, son of Moog, Bane of the Juras family, Slayer of Galron. Something else, something else, a few more things. And would you like some chamomile tea? Oh, yeah, man. What it an intro. Just, like as a as as a rounded out character, Worf is is something else. I mean, what a journey! Like he, <laughs> he was he was. I mean, I can understand now why they used him as a character to cross over into DS Nine to 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 give that show a little bit more life because DS Nine, like you know, as a, like I said, huge fan of like my favorite um, uh, Star Trek. Was it series. season five? Worf joined it, I think, around season. I five. feel like yeah, it was when they changed uniforms. To the okay. grey topped uniforms, I feel like he was he was part of that uh, transition, and his whole um, you know his whole journey was it was fabulous. Like it really was something else. Um, but they've they've taken they, they've taken that, and this way you can see it's been written by fans. They've taken where he ended in you know the DS Nine and the and the um, the movies, and just given him this like almost like Ronin samurai kind of life where. He, he's like found in a piece, but is still brutal. Like, I mean, we I don't, mean it's the first time you get and see Worf decapitate someone, isn't it? Probably on screen. That scene with Raffi was just yeah. Those two, I thought they were gonna. I thought there was gonna be a bit of a bit of a love connection there, but I'm glad it didn't. And I'm glad it was like a mutual respect of warriors, which was which is all <laughs> really all you really want from Worf. Um, 
something that I, I did have a problem with was, and this is really weird for me, uh, is the amount of swearing that the characters did. It felt shoehorned in. It and does Wolf take you out of it only, a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Wolf is the only character that didn't, that I can remember. Like, I don't remember him swearing, which is why I, I think why I'm more excited about him as a character coming back than a lot of the others. Because, you know, you can get, you can get away with like giving Data a curse word because he's it's, it's like a child swearing for the first time almost, you know. He's the, but when, you know, if Worf ran, ran around dropping F-bombs and, you know, calling people shitheads, like it would just, it, it would really ruin it. And he didn't. And I was really, I really liked that. I liked his, the respect that he has for his art, which happens to just be, you know, cutting people to pieces. Well, one thing I think we need to get into is Ed Spiel- Spielers, Spellers, Ed Spielers, I'm going to call him who plays Jack Crusher and who totally, obviously, from the first time we see him, is definitely not Picard's son, which, of course, he is. Completely not Picard's Completely not. actual I like the son. fact that even his haircut, you can see that when he goes bald, because he, he's got that kind of high four line, I was like, on his head, I was just like, <laughs> they picked someone who, yeah, he's got hair now, but you could totally see him bald and looking exactly like his old man. But I, I mean, thought he either, did either such that. a good job, man. Oh, yeah. That's such a yeah. hard role. Yeah, I mean, either, uh, and also about the hairline, either they did that or makeup did an incredible job yeah. on that. <laughs> like, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me now that they, you know, they just took a straight razor to him and just cut that hairline in. Uh, but, you know, he was brilliant. And I was I was shaky on him to start with because I was, yeah, yeah. You, know, you know, I remember... Uh, the, because he was Picard's more a MacGuffin sons, in the character, he? wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was. Um, but Picard's had a couple of sons. I mean, we sh- oh, were probably yeah. better off forget- forgetting Tom Hardy's uh, stint as a clone of Picard. I forgot in that Star Trek Star Trek Resurrection. So Shinzo, you know, Shinzo or something. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, shit. Yeah. I, e- either way, uh, whatever his name was, <laughs> Shitsu, the Star Trek dog. Um, <laughs> he, he, uh, uh, yeah, he's so yeah. They they uh, as soon as he was on he, he's on screen, he's with Beverly Crusher. You're like, oh, cool. So Picard's got a son, and that's been one of the things that throughout uh, Star Trek history has been like a, a a subtle uh pain for picard like he's never he's like you know his in generations his brother and nephew dies so you know he's he's trying to he's trying to find this this legacy that he can never get hold of and he thought that would be that would be his legacy that his nephew would be the one and you know he would carry on the family name but that got taken away from him so you know they've always hinted at like picard like with the, the family line it, it will end with him and it it's always going to be a stronger story when you give picard something to fight for and that legacy is the ultimate thing for him to fight for so picking an actor who can who can like v- like roll with those punches yeah, yeah. I mean, you you found maybe one of ten people in the world that could do that, and that was amazing. The kid done good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I just said. So yeah, the big plan of the whole show was essentially the Borg's idea to basically assimilate everyone using transporters and turn anyone genius. Under the age. Have and the funniest thing is, and they make all the analogies, don't they? That wait a minute, we have to use an old ship. Hmm, wonder yeah. what old ship we could possibly use that's not oh, networked you know into the system. You know what? I thought they were going to use a Defiant, and I didn't even <laughs> didn't even think. Well, because they've blown the fucking Enterprise D yeah, but to pieces. Sure, he's had a bit of time on his hands, you know. Well, I mean, f- I mean that's a, a lot, lot of, of time. time. <laughs> I mean, like I know, I know, you know, like I've got a family full of engineers that, that you know have built steam engines from scratch. Like that took him a long old time, but he built an entire fucking starship. And I do like the way that they um that they kind of uh, that they explain it away. Like, oh, the nacelles came from this ship, and that you know this part <laughs> came from that. I was like, fuck off! He still built an entire starship. I yeah, mean, the he's carpet good. Came from British Heart Foundation. Oh, didn't it just? Didn't it just? But can we can we talk about Geordie really quickly? Because uh, you know we talked we talked about we talked about Worf and. Um, and his like his like samurai ways, but again another character that I feel like they really nailed where he would end up was LaForge, like running running a museum, like being the guy that's like tending to all those ships, like the, like a, like a caretaker, like a, a perfect a perfect way for, like place for him to be. Like you know, his one of his daughters is um, uh, like uh, the helmsman 
on on the, the Titan, Titan and the other one yeah. and the other one is basically his personal assistant. So, you know, <laughs> you've also got you've you've got like like warring sisters there almost, like one that and, follows it that says does everything a dad says and the other one that just is the opposite almost. And isn't the actress actually his daughter who plays the assistant? I'm sure that's his actual daughter. I believe so. It? I believe yeah, yeah. so, yeah. So I mean, you know, you can't go wrong with that. I have to talk a bit of uh, Riker, my favourite Riker scene of the whole thing. And it's probably going to be the same one, man. When him and Picard have right. the big argument on the bridge, on the bridge at the end of episode two or three, and he just turns you, "You've killed us all. Get off my bridge." I was like, Ugh. "Yeah, that was good. That was truly spectacular to see two people that have got so much like respect, admiration, and love for each other just just, just losing going their at shit." It. Yeah, it was just awful. absolutely going at it as well. And and like for Riker to tell Picard that he's wrong, like even like back in the day, that was like few and far between. But when it happened, you paid attention because you were like fuck all right he's you know he they, they they truly believe in in the things that they're saying and that's important my favorite Riker moment was where he picks up the batleth from wharf and you find out the batleths weigh about as much as a car <laughs> <laughs> it's so, i mean little things like that that make you realize that that give you um that, that give you a perspective on these characters and what their abilities are by tiny little things like that where like he literally pans in the batleth and he drops to the floor with it i it killed me i thought it was great well, that, that brings me to my favourite Wharf moment of the season, other than his intro, which is in the second or the last episode when they're getting the teams to go over. And he goes, I will come too. I will make it a threesome. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't one of them say, you can hear yourself, right? Can you hear the words you're saying? Yeah. With a well-rounded Riker, you also get a well-rounded relationship with uh, him and Deanna Troy, which, like, obviously, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but, um, you know, his his reactions to the stuff that they'd set up in the last two seasons I thought was really really good so Riker again like getting a little bit of depth on on a character who can be quite gung-ho and quite like two-dimensional Jack the lad like yeah yeah you but you get this feeling you get this like um, like angry softer side to him which was which was amazing I think we have to talk a few of the little cameos we had coming back I mean no I, I mean I think everyone was surprised when we saw Michelle Forbes come back as Ro Lauren as well, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then um, again the Battlestar links because she was obviously in that playing the commander of the opposing Battlestar. Do you remember that bit? Oh, I do. That was a so, great, oh, God, yeah, yeah, great. That arc. was an exact copy as well of they did the exact same thing in the original eighties Battlestar where they find another mm-hmm. Battlestar and the person on that outranks Adama, and they did exactly the same thing with that. With and of course you go on Michelle Forbes' ship in Battlestar, and they're essentially like the US at the start of the. Uh, the war just torturing all the prisoners and all that kind of shit they even had i oh, remember yeah. they did they did the whole like p- prisoners in a like fucking it was just horrific man that's that's why battlestar was so good man but getting back from that ro lauren coming in and just <laughs> you felt picard's thing there because and you for, i forgot about how much she was in it in the original in uh, the next generation with him yeah and, like, you see the hurt in him man when he when uh, that and when she like does a suicide run at the end you're like oh, they brought loaf back and she's gone also had a laugh in the finale as well. Shelby comes back, who we haven't seen for fucking since the best of both worlds, I don't think. She was sent over from Starfleet in the best of both worlds to be the new first officer or something like that. She was a bit of a dick in it. And then she's an admiral. Okay. And she's the one who gets... Um, oh, yeah! You remember? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah that, 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 that escaped me for a second. Yes. Oh, that, yeah. I mean, come on, man. Like... It, 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 that's attention to detail there that is is incredible incredible we've not even touched on um uh, patrick stewart's performance as as picard again like i mean he's getting on now and he easily any monologue he got he held with like shakespearean breadth and depth like i uh, just for a guy in his 80s yeah you're on your spot there because i felt in season 2 and even a bit in season 1 he looked and felt his age on screen and that was gone yeah. in season three. Like season three, yeah. he was just back to the Picard we know and love. And I don't know whether yeah. that was a conscious choice by the, his as an actor to play it older in those seasons or uh, like the directors and the producers were like, yeah, this is kind of how we want you to do it. But he was just classic Picard in season three, wasn't he? Yeah, no, he was. But And, and they were clever about the way that they, they used him on screen. They didn't have him running around so much because that's where it, that's where it, um, it, it, it came across like the physicality of his character but they didn't need to he was based on a ship the whole time he didn't have to do any like really big action scenes if he did he just had to fire a phaser but they gave him they gave him important linchpin things to do that that really really like he just crushed it as and i was just i was just mind blown mind blown about it really really impressed 
Well, he crushed something, if you know what I'm saying. What? <laughs> bow chicka bow bow. Um, so I think what we, uh, as we kind of get to the end, is what we need, man, and this is what the fans want. We want Star Trek Legacy now. We want an ongoing show with Captain Seven, with Jack Crusher on the bridge, and because uh, those new characters are so good, and this is what the fans want. They want that show now. Go off, have an ongoing storyline, bring back this Dominion storyline, have that be an ongoing thing, and just yeah. you can. And then, of course, what you do, you bring back motherfucking Cisco, man. That's what we want. Yeah. We want to see Avery Brooks step. I mean, I don't know if he will because he barely acts these days. He hasn't done a lot at all. He's, I think, he's just quite happy doing whatever he's doing now. But that would be the the, the biggest reaction of Star Trek fans in ages, man. Captain Cisco oh, totally. coming back. He still does like uh, conventions and stuff, so that he's still he's still in that world. I think that uh, you know, um, and if I can just add in before we do get to the end of this, um, the the very end of this uh, the, this season three, uh, Q turns up again, which pissed me right off oh, because yeah. be, because they missed out bringing Wesley Crusher back and talking to his brother. Like if you switch that scene and it's Wesley Crusher comes back as this all seeing like, you know, Oracle that he is now. And he goes, you know, we don't need Q anymore. Like he fucking did his thing. Let him, let him, you know, you don't, you don't think too, you think too, or too linearly, like, you know, whatever. Bring Wesley Crusher back and go, right, you're my brother. I've got to warn you about something. This is big. This is a big deal. All of a sudden you go, what? That's huge. Next season huge. on. Huge. Star Trek Legacy. Yeah. And exactly. It goes straight into Legacy and it would be, it would just, what a setup. You just go, what? Wesley Crusher's back. They've the got to be thinking it right, man. They've got to be thinking because the the word of mouth and like the social interaction and that's how shows are based these days with streaming and all that. It's through the roof for Picard season three. It's like, everyone's like, we didn't expect this after how badly season two went. But uh, yeah, season three, it's hopefully you breathe new life into it. When it comes to uh, like again more uh, more characterization and the way and the way that it was uh, it was all put together and played and being faithful to the old series to the old movies because there's a lot you can you can dismiss about those movies if you wanted to, but they didn't they didn't seem to want to they wanted to keep the whole like uh, the whole legacy intact. Even the dog shit bits in the movies where um, they jump in a doom buggy for no reason and just go tear ass and around a planet. I mean, sure. The way that they revived Data, like as a character, like, I mean, I'm never upset when there's lots of Data in an episode because he's so obtuse without realizing it. I mean, um, First Contact, hands down, flat out, the Star Trek movie of my generation. Um you yeah. know, he remember going to see that in the cinema, mate. Oh, yeah, it was. I remember that as well. It was, it was <laughs> truly like, and we were shell shocked coming out of it, going, That, how did you? I had no idea that Star Trek could be that fucking amazing, like, and we already loved it, so yeah, huge. But you know, Brent Spiner, they, they had to they had to make him look old, and they're like, Well, we've actually already touched on this because we've made Picard a robot now, which you know, Q could have sorted out in when he clicks his fingers in uh, in season two, but nah, fuck that. Don't worry about you know, putting him back together and clearing up that plot hole. Um, but yeah, like like data, uh, the the way I, I kind of wish they did it a bit quicker. Um, his his character, yeah, it, it dragged out. It was like, oh, there's a partition, and you're like, well, just pull the partition out because data all fucking win, like, and he'll do it cleverly because Lorne is yeah, Lorne is tough and he always wins, blah blah blah. And there's some of you know, um, Sung is in there as well. But like it, the second there's a partition, you can you could see the trope, you could see those typical star trek tropes and it was like we're so we're being too we're being cautious because it's important to be cautious and then you know for a fact that the second you open those floodgates the you know data is always going to win so they could have done that quicker for me and that would have been we yeah, would have yeah. got more two, he did spend what two episodes just standing around in a room yeah just plugged into the computer minimum yeah, just being like yeah i mean he was basically a supercomputer and obviously that was I liked the way that he was basically the security for Section Thirty One, Section Thirty One, Section Thirty. Yeah. So he was basically their their security droid. He was plugged in, and he was the thing that they had to get around to get, you know, the the the, the secrets. That was really cleverly done, I, man. I, yeah, love I love that. that. I, but like, they could have just gone. They could have gone. Oh, okay. It's really important that Data is uh, he's saved. So fucking save him. Save him quick and get more of his character because his new version is data 2.0 
uh, it, it was really interesting. And I was, I was bummed out that we didn't get more, you know, Data can throw in a swear word and I'm all right with it. You know, that's how good that character yeah. is. I'll, t- I'll tell you one thing. Uh, there's one other link as well with Battlestar and this version of Star Trek where they've, this season of Picard. Is it the Great Link? It's not the Great Link. I, I did. Your, your DS9 channeling, changeling. Oh, uh, that was no, bad. No, what it was is, that was terrible. That was so bad. But no, the point I was getting back to, the Battlestar Picard, what happens at the end? Will the Borg take over? Because the, the whole, every ship in the Federation decides to use some automation mm. to join all the ships up at once, which is, they even say it in the show, that's a bit Borg-like, isn't yeah. it? And what happens, they have to go to the one old ship that isn't networked in any way. What happened in the miniseries of Battlestar Galactica when the Cylon attacked? They took out every ship at once because they were networked. They were and yeah. Galactica was in a museum. Fuck. As a museum piece yeah. in the miniseries. Yeah. But I, I just love how... I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, they're bad because they stole it. I just love that how Ron D. Moore, who worked on Star Trek, took these ideas... Went off and did Paddle Star, and then Star Trek has gone. That was fucking good, though, wasn't it? <laughs> Let's take it back and just do it in our own way again. Yeah. And when it's done well, I don't care because it was again, it was just done so well. And when and when when you get uh, also, I want to know what happened to the Enterprise E. What did Worf do? We don't know that yet. Oh yeah, but apparently there's that little throwaway line where they mention, oh yeah, we made, we made it the Enterprise. What's the new ship called? It's the Enterprise G, is it? Uh, F G. It's got to be G. Yeah. It's got to be the G, because uh, but I, I thought the E was the one they fucked up, uh, that Wolf fucks up. But it's just like a little throw line goes, we don't talk about that, do we? Wolf? And he's like, well, I, we do not talk about that or something like that. It's like, and everyone's just like, what happened to the E? How did Wolf destroy an Enterprise? Yeah, we want to know. Wasn't that no? Because there wasn't uh, there was. It's not in the movies after. Uh, so first contact uh, it is with the introduction of that in fucking super impressive Enterprise E, which was. My favourite looking Enterprise. I mean, when when the D came on uh, season three, it's a character all of its own, and you know, and and you mm. get that vibe because you get that kind of majesty of when all the the main characters get on the bridge, and you know, Picard. You mentioned you, you pointed you sort of pointed at this earlier. Uh, Picard says, you know, the thing that I miss about all the all these ships that we've been on is the carpet. And you you fucking <laughs> it, I hadn't even I hadn't even thought about that. Like the inside of that ship was like rich leather and beige you know and carpets and and it looked and, and it was and then you go you go to the, the you go to the enterprise e and it's like it's just like metal floors everything looks like really industrial but for some reason there was this shining moment in in federation history where all the ships were like built by rolls royce and you know as opposed to a military and yeah i was like oh my god that's amazing so even the ship even the ship gets its moment as a character which is Fucking abs- absolutely correct. Before we round off and give our scores on Picard season three, let's talk about the future of Star Trek and where we're headed. At the minute, Discovery is coming to an end. I checked out on Discovery, maybe season three, but that was when they had this whole rights issue because it was on, I forget which channel it was on in the UK, and then it changed when Paramount Plus became a thing in the States, and we didn't get it for about a year, and I just lost it. I just lost track of it then. Shame. And then when it did come back, there was this whole time thing and... Burnham was somewhere else, and the characters went, and I, I just lost. Them. Yeah, they, I loved that. That's it. They got jumped into the future, and then I, I lost it. After they that. basically took uh, the idea of the ship. So the the ship that Burnham uh, commands, I forget, the, I forget the name of it now. Um, but the the ship that Burnham I- ends up, you know, taking into the future yeah. has to be lost because it's it's an old, uh, you know, an old series uh, set back in the past and that ship just suddenly goes missing and this is the story of that ship that goes missing so they jump it into the future and then they mod it and upgrade it so it's got like floating nacelles that aren't attached to the body of the ship they make it look really really cool mm. and it's the only thing that can travel because it's got the you know the um the black alert jump drive uh and it doesn't run on dilithium crystals and that's the the other whole thing and yeah it's i i enjoy so, that I enjoy are you that. up to date on discovery uh yes could i remember it now if i you know with what i've watched probably not i think the best thing to come out of discovery is michelle yo's character uh who's getting her own film i don't know there's a section 31 film I, coming i like i love michelle yo like Every time I see her in something, I'm like, oh, God, she just typecasts as this fucking 
you know, this like this Asian woman that's just going to have Type played. Typecast is, is awesome. Yeah, she, but, but yeah, but that's it. And then, and then she, but what she does by being like almost like the go to action woman of like now, um, you know, what she does is makes every single role independently her own. Like, so, so it could be scripted very, very similarly to her last role, but she will give that character such nuance, like that, that it, that every time I would go, oh God, are they cast there again. Give someone else a chance, and then I watch it, and I'm like, shut up, Ben. She's <laughs> fucking phenomenal. So yeah, so yeah, like you know what? That's Oscar winning Michelle Yeoh. It is, isn't it? Like, and good for her because I mean, because that movie was, uh, yeah, it was, it was. I, actually, I'm one of those people that just thought it was all right. Yeah, I'm the same. I, I, I thought it was good. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a little bit too long in places. Yeah. And I, I but I can't be angry about it because it was revolutionary, oh, yeah. and the fact they did such crazy things on such a low budget but anyway this is an everything everywhere all at once podcast <laughs> so um on to the next hours uh strange new worlds i've only seen the first two episodes but i liked what i saw uh Any, uh, how, how are you on that yeah i've watched all of it so far because that's, that's all you can watch okay. you can only get so far by watching all of yeah. it uh so yeah I've, I've watched the whole thing and so it's christopher pike and his uh his version of the enterprise um and mm. uh yeah it it it's very, very good. Like, it, but it's also very standalone. Like, I feel like they made it so that they, they. Yeah, I heard it's a throwback. Yeah. To the episode of the week thing. Yeah, and they to try and get away from the ongoing arc of discovery. They kind of this was like a direct. Correct. Yeah. That and and reaction to and, that. And and I think that's exactly the right move. But it also it also does uh, again feed into what we know of Star Trek and where Christopher Pike ends up because he has weird like flash forwards in like memories almost where he sees himself in that chair and all burnt and fucked up like he is in, in the original series. So it's, it's really good. Like it's really clever. Um, it's just, it's just ultimately because there isn't um, like a main, like a, a, one of those overarching stories that, that I've kind of, I've taken it for what it is, watched it episode of the week, loved it, put it in a box and left it there. Fair enough. And, I think something we both briefly mentioned at the start that a show had that has no right to be as good as it is, and that is Lower Decks, oh. an animated comedy about Star Trek. So good. Yet somehow has become my favourite episode so far was the Deep Space Nine one. Just the bit, the, the opening joke where they're like, again, this is audio, so they can't see you looking around the pylons again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the big joke at the start of that is they go, Oh, what are we doing? We're we just going to go around the pylons again. Yeah, again. No, no. One more time. One more time. We keep going around the pylons because it looks really cool. And going to Quarks and the fact that Quarks is now like a, a chain yeah, bar across the universe. That's so I good. It. It's so good. So um, if I'm allowed to, if I'm allowed to name drop a little bit, um, I was la- last year. Um, I was hanging out at um, an American festival with some friends, and um, Wesley Crusher was there. Like he. He's a friend of a friend, and you know I met Will Wheaton, and he was talking about Lower Decks. I was chatting to him about his podcast, sorry, his his um, his, uh, his vlog and his like YouTube stuff. Um, I have, like I say, I literally have, I have no, because he, he, he's a professional. There's no way that he's gonna fucking tell he's tell not gonna tell, tell you. some schmuck that he just met. Um, but you know, like he was he was truly truly lovely, and one of those people that that really enjoyed talking about the art that he's created, whether it be his, um, you know, his, his online stuff or, or, you know, next generation and stuff like that. But, but what I'm getting to here is I truly hope that it is a lower decks tie in and that he has something to do with it in any way, you know, whether it, whether it ties to, you know, series three or well, or whatever. it's interesting. You mentioned it. I, my first thought, if you, he's mentioned about seeing season three of Picard, that wouldn't make me think lower decks. That would make me think that if this star Trek legacy spinoff comes out, that he's, cause he's the brother of the main character. Right? That's probably where I was coming from. Where, so, where I was like, why is it, where's the crusher in this? So, that's probably where, and, and you've, you well, you mentioned it earlier in the pod, but that's probably where they're going to go for the show, right? Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I hope so. Like, like I say, it's 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 actually frustrating as all hell how little he said about it <laughs> and how much I've put in my mind, like overthought this. Yeah, yeah, honestly, honestly though, he was he was he was so gracious and so and so lovely. Oh, you know what it probably was? He does the. Um, I don't know if we get it over here. He did the ready room, didn't he? So 
you know, like the Talking Dead and the show after the show. Okay. He does that in America. Yeah, yeah. That's probably what that was. Uh, oh, for Picard. Yeah, he did it for Picard. Or just start. All oh, right, yeah, we don't no, get that over we here, didn't, do we? we? didn't get it. So that's probably what he was. It... God damn you, America. Oh, America! I mean, admittedly, he did make this show and bring it to us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but no, I, yeah, I mean that's that clearly that's clearly what it is. So he, when he was talking about that, he must have been yeah. talking about the ready room. Ah, oh, dude, that would have been that would have been so cool. Let's let's make up a bunch of conspiracies now. <laughs> no, 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 it's it's definitely Star Trek Legacy that hasn't been confirmed or even made yet. He's <laughs> definitely coming back into that. It's definitely what it's going to be. But the last thing here on our epic Star Trek talk, I have to mention. And I don't know if you know this, Boimler and Mariner from Star Trek Lower Decks, played by Jack Quaid and Tony Newsom, could be appearing in live action form, in Strange New World somehow. Because I'm not sure how that's going to work, unless there's some time travel thing. Yeah. Because Lower Decks is set, like, modern day, I guess. Because, well, no, they, 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 like, Deep Space Nine's a thing, in it? They talk about, yeah, generation. and uh, Well, they talk about um, the, the ships that the characters for Next Generation have after the Next Generation finishes. So it's Captain Riker, and because Boimler goes to Captain Riker's yeah, ship, yeah. doesn't he? That's it. I mean, oh, and I, I love that, like we said, we said about the, the uh, DS9 episode, when you had a uh, Nana Visitor as a uh, Colonel, is it Colonel Kira now? Major, Ma- Ma- it was Major, Major Kira, Kira, yeah. I just love her and um, oh, the, the Bajoran security guy, I forget his name, and they're just one-upping each other about who saved each other's life the whole way through oh, it. Oh, yeah. No, but I wouldn't have died if you hadn't saved me then. And... But they're both trying to give the prize to the other person, aren't they? Because that's yeah, such yeah, a Star Trek yeah. thing to do. It's like, you know, like, like be humble in the face of being awesome. And taking that into account, Ben... I'm going to go throw to you first for Picard. You'll score out of 10. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's unfair to give it 10 out of 10. I don't think we're going to see, I don't think we're going to see a Star Trek series that is quite as perfectly balanced. I don't think we're going to see a Star Trek series or movie now that is going to be able to pay such incredible fan service off in such an, an imaginative and varied way. Um, like, yeah, I'm I'm 100% comfortable giving this top, top marks. And if you don't, you're a complete bastard. Uh, I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. Only because, and this is one of your points you brought up. My only point is, like, I, I could have done without it being the Borg again as the ultimate bad guy. I would have been happier if it had been this new Dominion rising yep. up as the main bad guy. I get guys. that. But, but that's, count, that's, like, that's the point. To, of, counter, to counter that point really quickly, it's the way they decided to assimilate people. Genius. Fucking genius. Very clever. With the transports. Yeah, yeah, also, that. only the young people. That's like that's a nod to technology taking over like people's lives. Like, it, I, come on, man. Like, it's it's the allegory that we were talking about earlier on, and that for me gives it that extra point back. I'll, I'll fight you. I'll fight you. <laughs> well, that's all the time we've got on our Star Trek and our Mando Star Wars sci-fi extravaganza spoiler special because we just ran out of time. We've been talking too much, which means we're not going to have time to get to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 in this episode. But Ben is going to join me again very soon and we are going to plough straight into... I was going to say Star-Lord. That sounds wrong. <laughs> That's <very> wrong. <laughs> uh, remember that time you ploughed into Star-Lord? Star-Lord, you filthy man. <laughs> you beast. And that's all the time we got for today. We'll see you next time. Bye, Ben. See you later, mate. We Needed Roads.